Okay, if you have been noticing uh, on the videos, we've been doing smaller videos, but we've been doing more in class. We've been doing more of bibliology in class, and we've been going through how to get close with God and what's the purpose of mankind. But this I'm going to talk about in class, but I really needed to record this because uh, the Bible says we got to know the times. And right now the Bible is up on the attack. And I pray that you will get this on social media and get this out to your friends. Let your family watch this because this is very important. The Bible said that the word of God is true and that God cannot lie. And the Bible says that God had written this word by the inspiration meaning God breathed. Now people are saying that this is not the word of God and that if it is the word of God, then it has error. If, if it's not true, then it's a lie. But the Bible says that God cannot lie. And so I want to talk about inerrancy. The inerrancy of the Bible, the definition of inerrancy is that the Bible is exempt from liability. We're talking about mistakes and capable of error. And all the teachings, they are perfect and according to the truth. That's why 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures are inspired. God breathed. Thea Nustas. God breathed the scriptures, were breathed out by God. The Bible is inspired infallible, inerrant, immutable word of the Holy God. Now, not only do we see the definition of inerrancy, but the deception of inerrancy. To suggest that there are errors in the Bible is to mess up the character of God because God cannot lie. If the Bible have errors, it is the same as suggesting that God can fail. He's phony. He's fickle that he makes mistakes. The very nature of God is at stake and that he do not make mistakes. And Aaron, the scriptures are free from error and correspond at the very point to what is true with God as a reference point. Of course, this is a quality claim only of the original writings, not the copies, not the translations. The Bible is also inerrant. It contains no factual errors, historical fallacies, scientific blunders, or spiritual delusion. It is perfect in every jot and tittle. And according to Proverbs 30, verse 5, quote, every word of God is tested, end of quote. That means every word is pure and true. The Bible is the only book that never makes mistakes. Everything it says is true. John 17, 17. Sanctify them in thy word because thy word is true. And the word of God is perfect and without error. That word inerrant means that the word is perfect. It means that the original copies of each manuscript written by each Bible, the books represent the author. There was nothing of mistakes, no tingling of error, no tiny error. Further, the excellency of the Holy Spirit protection of the scripture over the centuries has ensured that the copies delivered into your hand from generation past are essentially the same. It is active. It is powerful. It is still active. It is still alive. It is not dead. Psalms, two, Psalms 90, Psalms 90, from throughout all generations, you are God, and his word is true. <clears throat> Even every literature critic who claim no faith in the truth, when they look at the Bible and the structure of the sentences and of the paragraph, the Bible attests to being the most complete, reliable of any book transmitted from the antiquities. It never changed with time. It remains the same throughout all time. In terms, it is actually remaining unchanged and dependable of its accuracy. Inerrancy means that when all the facts are known, the scripture and the original autographs and properly interpreted will be shown to be holy. That is W-H-O-L-L-Y. True in everything they teach, whether that it teach on the doctrines of the word, history, science, geographic, genealogies, 
or the discipline of knowledge that man come to know. How do you think the Supreme Court came with thou shalt not kill? It is from the word of God. To suggest that there are errors in the Bible is to mess up the character of God. If the Bible has error, it is the same as suggesting that God can fail. He is fake and phony. That he can make mistakes. To assume that God can speak a word that is contrary to the fact is to assume that God himself cannot operate without error. The very nature of God is at stake here. And a part of this inerrancy, I want to talk about two things. Infallible and immutable. First, infallible. The Bible is infallible. The Bible in its entirety, from Genesis to Revelation, has no mistakes. Specifically in the original autographs, it is without mistakes. It is without error. God's word is infallible. The Bible in its entirety has no mistakes. It is flawless. It is it's without fall, fl flaws. So it's faultless and flawless and without blemish because it was written by God. Who character has no blemish? According to Psalms 19 and 7, notice what the Bible says, quote, the law of the Lord is perfect, end of quote. <clears throat> that word law is synonymous with the word of God. It is flawless because it was the author by God. And he is flawless. Therefore, if God wrote the Bible, and if he is the ultimate authority, and if his character is flawless, then the Bible is flawless. And, and is the ultimate authority. Who does the authority? Belongs to God. You see the fact that God is perfect, demands the original autograph. The original giving of the word of God must also be perfect. So the Bible is infallible. That is the first reason to study it. Because you can depend on it. It is the only book that never makes a mistake. Everything that is said is true. Infallible refers to the fact that the Bible is unfailing as an absolute trustworthy guide of your faith. So if faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God, you can trust it. It is the belief in God. It's not just words, but in the beginning was the word, the word with God, and the word is God. But not only that, the belief in God, but the practice. Be not conformed to the ways of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may present your body as a living sacrifice. The word of God transforms you. This also is because the first thing is God is true. John 3, 33, whoever receives his testimony set his seal to this, that God is true. John 3, verse 33. But also, I've quoted it earlier, John 17 and 3. And this is eternal life, that you know the only true God, Jesus Christ, who he has sent. <coughs> God is true, but also his word reveals his truth. John 17, 17, sanctify them in thy truth because your word is true. God is true. His word reveals his truth. But also, God cannot lie. Numbers 23, 19. God is not like man that he should lie. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the age begins. He cannot lie. Hebrews 16, Hebrews 6, 18. Oh, that by two unchangeable things, two unchangeable things, which is impossible. For God cannot lie, neither can he change. There is no shadow of turning. Which leads us to the second thing, not only infallible, but he's immutable. Scripture cannot be altered and should not be altered to fit your life. The reason that you're having problems that the word of God is inerrant, infallible, inspired is because you want to live a life that you want to. And therefore, you become the authority versus the word and the word is God. And you don't want that authority in your life. Scripture bears God character. So Hebrews 6, 18 says, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible. Number one, that God cannot lie and that he cannot change. He the same today and forevermore. 
Scripture cannot be altered. John 10, 35. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, Scripture cannot be broken. Scripture cannot be altered. A very famous one, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 18. Notice what it says. Do not think that I come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Verse 18 says, For since truly I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a jot, not an iota, not a tilt, not a dot, not a dot of the I, not the crossing of a T will pass from the law until all is accomplished. That jot is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. The tittle is the smallest mark of a projection that served to distinguish one letter from another, much as the bottom stroke of a capital E to distinguish from an L. Nothing in scripture, even the smallest stroke, is without significance. I like what Luke 16, 17, but it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away rather than one tittle <clears throat> dot of the law to become void. Jesus' point is not that all that the commandments of the law remain in effect forever. The Pharisees thought that they were in the kingdom of God, but the Lord was saying in effect, you cannot disregard the great moral law of God. The verse also is important, one of the doctrines of immutable and inerrancy of scripture. Christ said the awesome act of the universe being destroyed is more likely than for something God has given in his word to be inaccurate. So the accuracy, God is a spirit. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Before he was born of a virgin, he existed to be eternal God. And this eternal God became the son of man through a virgin birth. He lived a perfect life for 33 years. And after 33 years, he was built, he was beaten, whipped with a cat of nine tails, Blood came streaming down with anxiety. He was hung on a cross. He had a crown of thorns on his head and he was buried for three days and three nights and rose with all power and ascended on the right hand of God. Man was made after the image of God. He rebelled against God and he violated his law and led him to ruins and knowing that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, there is none righteous, no, not one. And the wages of sin is death. And you will live in an eternal hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ became the just and the justifier of our faith. And if you put your total faith and trust in this risen Savior, this in, inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God says, when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. But how can we call without a preacher? How can we come to say Jesus Christ is Lord, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, unless by the Spirit of God? Well, where does that leave you on your knees, smoking your chest, and say, Lord, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And I'm going to tell you, from throughout all eternity, it's not when he went to the cross that he was a Savior. It's by his nature. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. Come to Jesus Christ.